everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, Quantum Alignment Show. This week, we're going to be talking about relationships, and I'm actually going to be getting back to some of the basics of relationship, but looking at some of the basics of relationship through uh, a little bit of a different perspective, through maybe a little bit more modern eyes. So uh, I'm excited to revisit some of these topics. You know, part of why I like to revisit, especially when we talk about relationships, is I don't know about how it is for you guys. When you go into relationships, even if you think you know everything, right? (laughs) Sometimes you have to recalibrate yourself and go back to the basics of remembering how to get along with this person that you love so much, right? We have a tendency sometimes to go through cycles where maybe our own personal bandwidth for dealing with drama goes down to a small little tiny bandwidth. We have a lot of stuff going on in our own lives and we have expectations about our partners perhaps filling in those places where maybe we think we're too stretched. And then of course, without good communication, things sometimes fall apart and you have to sort of start over. One of the things that I love so much about human design as a tool, and this is actually something that you guys have reflected back to me, is that yes, human design is an incredible tool to help you live true to yourself, true to who you really are. It's also a really great tool to help you learn how to love the people in your life better. I have eight children. They have all been raised almost from the beginning of their lives. A couple of them are a little bit older, but they've all grown up knowing their human design. And I, most importantly, have grown up knowing their human design. So when I looked at my children, having that information really gave me the opportunity to really see them for who they are and to parent them in such a way that I could support them in becoming the full expression of who they are. When we are in any kind of a relationship, when I surveyed my, I'm backing up and jumping forward because my enthusiasm is getting the best of me here. A few years ago, I surveyed my list and I asked you guys, what's the biggest thing you got out of human design? And one of the answers was that Not only did you learn about yourself and how you operate, what you really loved and appreciated the most about your human design knowledge is that it really helped you be a better partner in your relationships. It helped you really see and accept people for who they are. So my intention for us today as we go through this material, even though it might seem like it's rudimentary information on a certain level, is for you to use this as a tool to not only figure out what you need to get to feel seen and to feel heard and to feel loved in your relationships and to learn how to ask for that, but to also use it as a tool to see your partners so that you can be a better partner and really learn to love and accept your partners for who they are and your children and your parents and your coworkers and everybody. So, so here we go. Enhancing communication with human design. So basically what I'm going to do for you guys over this next hour, so whip out your charts, whip out your loved one's charts. Let's look at, let's look at communication and let's look at communication in the context of charts. The first place where we oftentimes tend to break down in our communication is our failure to communicate with, uh, when we don't fail, (laughs) failure to communicate in a way that's right for each type. Manifesting generators and gener- uh, sorry, manifesting generators and manifestors need to inform. That's part of the strategy for those types, but they also need to be informed. And in just a minute, I'm going to break this out in just a little bit more uh, more depth. Remember that the strategy for the manifestors and the manifesting generators is to take stock of who's going to be impacted by their actions, and to make sure that they are informing, so that when they inform. People know what to expect. They're not hit by this blast of moving creative energy that can oftentimes be confusing or distracting or even destabilizing if you don't know what's coming. We oftentimes talk about strategy as being something you do according to your type, but we forget sometimes to also remember that strategy actually goes both ways, that not only do manifestors and manifesting generators need to inform, but they also need to be informed. 
And when they are informed, it actually minimizes the frustration and the anger that they can experience. Generators and projectors need to be asked, invited, or recognized. And in just a minute, I'm going to break that down for you into more specifics because you want to be mindful of how you ask a projector because you don't want to kick your projector back into their conditioned sacral response. Nobody, by design, is designed to be told what to do, even kids, by the way. There are ways to communicate with children that enhance their ability to cooperate with you and not drop them into resistance automatically by telling them what to do. Reflectors need time and freedom to change their perspectives and their views over time because it's in the process of taking the time to feel their way through whatever it is they need to feel their way through as part of their experience that they get clarity. And if they don't have the time, if you're putting pressure on your reflector and you're not giving them the freedom to really be in the flow of their own inner timing, then you oftentimes can be pressuring them to make a decision that's not correct. And then they experience the theme of disappointment, which is my segue into our next little section. We need to talk about the emotional theme of the types and how that impacts communication. We don't get excited about the emotional themes on the human design charts. When I do readings for people, or even when I when people get their free chart with their little report and they see their type and it says on next to the type, their emotional theme, and it says things like anger, frustration, bitterness, that's usually the one people really have problems with, or disappointment. They're like, what does this mean? Nobody wants to be considered to be angry or frustrated or bitter or disappointed. And I think a lot of times when we look at the emotional themes in human design, we don't use it as a barometer for alignment with correct behavior and choices. And when I say correct, I mean aligned behavior and choices according to your human design type. And I think that sometimes, especially when we look at the way sometimes human design is taught, that that emotional theme can sometimes be used as an excuse. And I've seen this happen before where sometimes if your theme is anger and you get angry, then instead of going, "Hmm, what's my anger telling me? We say, well, I'm angry because that's my type or I'm frustrated because that's my type or I'm bitter because that's my type or I'm disappointed because that's my type. And we don't listen to the message that the emotional theme is telling us. Sometimes we don't listen to the message that the emotional theme is informing us because we don't, if you're the one experiencing it, it's oftentimes hard to check in and hear what yourself is telling yourself. The truth is when you are in partnership with someone and they understand your human design type and they understand the emotional theme of your type, It's really beautiful when somebody who loves you can see you getting into the emotional theme of your type for them to be able to say, hey, there's this thing going on here with you and your emotional energy. I feel like something's off for you. You're out of alignment a little bit. How can I support you in bringing yourself back into alignment? So in the next little section of slides, what I'm going to share with you is What does the emotional theme mean when it gets triggered? Because, and again, I'm not judging the emotional theme. I have no judgment against an angry manifester or an angry manifesting generator or a frustrated generator or a frustrated manifesting generator or a bitter projector or a disappointed reflector. But if we don't also recognize that that experience of the emotional theme is a form of communication and we don't support the people we love when they're experiencing the pain that sometimes comes with the emotional theme, we're missing an opportunity to serve our partners in a most loving and generous way. So our first type, and I'm just going to play with the quantum names for you guys. Uh, The quantum name of the manifester is called the initiator. And if you remember uh, information about the manifester, you'll know that the manifester is here to serve an inner nonverbal creative flow. 
And that when they serve that creative flow and they inform the people who are impacted by their movement or commitment to movement and action based on that creative inspiration and flow, that they not only serve that creative flow, they actually serve the purpose of initiating others through their action. Because the manifester or the initiator has this internal nonverbal creative flow that has to be served in order for the initiator energy to stay healthy and for them to feel good and for them to feel aligned with their purpose. And it's an, it's a big amount of energy. It's a huge surge of energy that doesn't have a lot of, of transformers or regulators that downgrade it into language. It's pure divine inspiration that they're in the flow of. And they oftentimes, the initiator types have to oftentimes wait for right timing and right circumstances to be able to follow that flow. When the initiator starts on that flow, if in the process of serving that flow and bringing it into form, they get interrupted, maybe they forgot to inform, right? Or maybe somebody who thinks they know better about the process of the initiator decides to give them advice or to ask them if they need help, or gets in their way in some way, the initiator type can experience the emotional theme of anger. Anger can be a problematic emotional theme, especially if you're a woman, because in our society, we still don't have a very good way, a very good belief system or collective identity that supports women in experiencing anger. We don't like angry women in our Western society. And so if you are a manifester who is now experiencing anger, now oftentimes what happens for the, for the manifester when they experience the anger is they're trying to push it down because we're never usually celebrated for experiencing our anger, right? Nobody says, wow, you have the right to be angry. Or, Ooh, that's a good feeling. Let it go. Come on, let it rip. Let's get some anger going here, right? We don't usually get excited about anger. And oftentimes what happens is that the energy gets pushed down and pushed away. And then the manifester type or the initiator type loses connection with their divine power, their creative potential. I want to invite us into a reframe of the emotional theme of anger and to see it as creative disruption. The manifester or the initiator type tends to get angry when their creative flow gets disrupted. And it's not because they're angry. In fact, I don't think that's the right word for it. It's that that creative spark didn't get to be fulfilled. And it's a nonverbal creative spark that has a certain amount of speed and alignment through action associated with it when the timing is right. And when it gets interrupted, that energy, it's like a lightning bolt. It's got to go somewhere. And so the manifester type seemingly explodes, right? but they're not really exploding and they're not really angry. They've had their creative flow disrupted. And the part of the challenge is oftentimes when that creative flow gets disrupted, you can't get it back. And that energy has to go out and then back down into the earth because if it doesn't get moved, it's banging around inside the body of the initiator. And that's not healthy either. So let's start exploring the idea of recognizing that the anger of the manifester isn't I'm angry because I'm a manifester and I can be angry but rather that a manifester who is experiencing anger is experiencing disrupted creative flow. And that if you love a manifester and they're experiencing anger for you to step back and hold space and do your best to be supportive in facilitating an environment that allows them to either rediscover their creative flow if that's possible, or to make sure that you are attuned to what they're doing, even if they forget to inform, because they might sometimes, because it's really not natural for the manifestor type to inform. And you get out of their way and don't ask them things like, what are you doing? Or do you need help? Or any of those things we're conditioned to do for each other, especially generator types. If you're in love with the manifestor, let them have their space so that they can serve that creative flow and know that if they didn't inform, that's not personal. It's that they're busy serving that flow. And secondly, if they do respond with anger, recognize that they're not mad at you. They're frustrated because the creative flow got disrupted. The generators who have a life purpose of taking ideas, things that they respond to, 
and responding to them again and again over time as a way of deepening their mastery. They're here to give form to inspiration through responding to what shows up in their outer reality. If you are a generator, you are here to see what's going on in your life and to follow the things that feel good and right for you. And ultimately, if you keep responding, to transform those things into mastery, things that are beautiful contributions to the world and to the lives of others. The quantum name that I like to give the generator is the alchemist. You're here to transform a response into something that is masterful. The emotional theme for the generator types or the alchemists is frustration. And frustration can be sometimes problematic because when you feel frustrated about something, the first tendency that we have is to quit. I hate this. I'm going to quit. I don't want to do this anymore. It's frustrating. I quit. Right? And when we quit, what happens is we never get the opportunity to keep following through on that momentum to let it reach its state of mastery, its state of excellence, the fulfillment of its expression. For us, if we look at the way in which the generator learns, the learning curve of the generator, the generator types have a stair-step learning curve. If you are a generator, it is natural for you to have when you try something new or you respond to something, for you to have an initial sort of honeymoon period with whatever that thing is. That initial response gives you an upward surge in your mastery and things, things happen. It feels good. Things are popping. Things are unfolding. It feels amazing. You're learning a lot. You're getting better. That's the first part of the cycle. It is also natural for generators to then hit a plateau, for them to feel stuck, for them to, at a certain point in their mastery, in a certain point of their transforming their experience into something beautiful, it's natural for them to hit a plateau where nothing seems to be growing, where you don't seem to be getting better, where the opportunities maybe aren't showing up the way they used to, where it feels like you're stalled in your progress. That's a normal part of the generator process. What that stalling out is or that plateau is, is not, oh, things have stopped happening. I should bail on this but rather opportunities for the generator to get ready to gain energy, to restock, restore, replenish reserves, to get ready for the next surge in mastery. Because the masterful path of the generator is like a stair step. It's up, surge, plateau, up, surge, plateau, up, surge, plateau. And the plateaus are vital parts of that creative process. Well, what happens a lot of times for the generator types is they hit that plateau and they go, oh, it's not working. I quit. And then they start over and they have another surge of mastery and they hit a plateau and then they quit. And they get another surge of mastery and they hit a plateau and they quit. And so they leave behind this sort of start, stop, start, stop, start, stop history of sort of getting things started, but never really bringing them to the full fruition. If you love a generator, and they begin the process of feeling frustrated. They're feeling frustrated all over the place. And I'll tell you this, I'm not a generator, but, but I'm a manifesting generator. So I have this as part of my theme too. I literally have been in a two year frustration cycle. It is just starting to shift. But in my home front, in my personal life, I have not been a very pleasant person to live with for the most recent years because I have been stomping around my house quite a bit in my private life with frustration because in my world right now, things have not been moving fast enough, which is kind of the mantra of the manifesting generator, but who is manifesting generator is also a generator type. So I want you guys to know that all generator types feel frustration. And sometimes those frustration cycles can last a while, but those cycles are about building momentum. So when you love your generator and they're feeling frustration, the best thing you can do for them is say, hey, I see you're feeling frustrated. Feels like things aren't moving fast enough, right? Mm, I get it. So let's talk through what do you need to do? Um, do you need to quit? Mm -mm. Ah, okay. Do you need to keep going? Mm -hmm. It's frustrating though, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do to move that frustration? Go walk, go swim, go do something physical so you can get back to being present to where you are and gain that momentum back so you can have that next surge in mastery. 
The thing is, when you hit a plateau, it's actually a good sign. If you're a generator type and you're frustrated and you're really like you're super frustrated, it's actually a sign that the momentum is building. And if you quit, you don't give yourself the gift of waiting for that next level of breakthrough. So it's good if you have people in your lives who get that about you, who can hold you to staying in that plateau or check in with you to make sure through responding that maybe it's time for you to quit. Sometimes it is time to quit. I'm not saying don't ever quit. Sometimes it is time to quit. But oftentimes for the generator types, we quit too soon and we don't get to have that next breakthrough that leads us to the next level of mastery. Again, remember that when you have a project, uh, sorry, a generator in your life and they are feeling frustrated, it's not personal. And sometimes it bleeds out everywhere. I can assure you that this is true and I am sorry. I wish my family was watching this because I would be apologizing to them yet again to say, I'm sorry. Sometimes it bleeds to everywhere. The manifesting generators who I like to call my time benders. The manifesting generator is just like a generator in that they have to respond, but they also have a certain element of that manifester initiator energy. So they have that internal nonverbal creative flow like the manifester types, but the need to respond like the generator types, which basically means they're a generator that responds. And when they have that stair step learning curve, instead of going up one step and then over and sitting on a plateau, they tend to leap over a couple of steps get up here where they're really out of their league in terms of being prepared and ready, get super frustrated, then oftentimes have to go back and duplicate the steps they skipped, which is also frustrating. And at the same time, they're following this internal nonverbal creative flow and it's not happening fast enough. And so you can get the perfect understanding of what happens sometimes as a natural part of the time bender process. So the, the emotional theme here is frustration and anger which is just like with the initiator type creative disruption. You got a manifesting generator moving through a room. They forgot to inform you get in their way. They're going to freak out at you. And it's not personal. It's that you got in the way of the creative flow. You were stand. This is the thing that happens in my house. I, I keep telling my family, please don't stand in the doorway. Please don't stand in the doorways. Please don't stand in the doorways. I'm moving through the house at high speed. And if you're in the doorway and I have to stop and, give you a hug, which I feel bad, but sometimes it's like, I can't hug you right now. I'm in the middle of my creative flow. I'll come back and hug you in a minute, right? Get out of the doorways. That's the same thing is true for the dogs. I'm always telling the dogs, get out of the doorway because I'm moving fast, right? When I get interrupted, when the manifesting generator gets interrupted, the response is that frustration and sometimes that anger, that mix of creative disruption and momentum. And oftentimes what happens is the manifesting generator feels alone or disconnected from source if they can't remember, oh, hey, I need to inform as well as respond. And people are not moving fast enough. And so you feel sort of like oh, all alone in your creative cycle. Love your manifesting generators. They might be, but they also feel frustrated. <laughs> the projectors. In the quantum human design system, we call the projector the orchestrator. The projector has the role of managing and guiding and directing others and gets placed through recognition and invitation with the right people who value what they have to say and who support them in sharing their wisdom and their knowledge because it's through the transmission of their wisdom and knowledge that the orchestrator gives the people that they are here to manage the information they need to minimize frustration, anger, to support and facilitate the gathering of momentum, the fulfillment of creative potential, and the expansion of mastery in the world. That is the role of the orchestrator. The emotional theme for the orchestrator, though, is bitterness. And bitterness can sometimes be, I think, in a lot of ways, one of the more problematic emotional themes. Because one of the things that happens with bitterness, and this is actually, I think, quite beautiful if you understand it, is that bitterness is actually an energy that can be repelling rather than compelling. When we bump into a bitter projector and they start exploring their bitterness out loud, that energy can oftentimes push you away from the projector, which is obviously the opposite of what the projector is really wanting. 
The reason why bitterness is repelling instead of compelling is that a projector who is bitter is telling you unconsciously two things. Number one, they are saying to you, I'm tired. I don't have the energy that everybody else has. I don't have the energy to pretend to be a generator or a manifester and go out in my life and surge and create and do things the way other people do. And I don't have the energy to even engage in the dialogue that we want to have right now. Number two, the projector is saying one other thing. They are oftentimes saying, I don't value myself enough to go home and take care of myself. Or I'm struggling with my sense of value in the world because I don't create like the rest of the types do. I don't create in the way society has been conditioning me to create. And in the way in which society has been teaching me, I have learned somewhere along the way that it's not okay for me to be how I am. If your projector love is bitter, they are unconsciously asking you to help them with their energy to remind them that it's okay that they are precious and valuable enough to rest and that in fact, the world needs them to rest because rested, restored, replenished, renourished, restocked, rejuvenated projectors have tremendous value to give the world. Depleted and exhausted projectors are still inherently valuable. They're valuable because they exist but they oftentimes need a reminder that it's okay to rest, that it's okay to restore their energy first before they go back out into the world and create. So pay attention when your projector loves talk to you and when they begin sometimes talking through the tone or through the emotional voice of bitterness, stay attuned to that because that energy, even though it can be repelling, is actually a call to you as someone who can see the bigger picture, who loves a projector, that this projector might need extra support, that that projector might need extra love, a little extra reminding about take a rest, take a pause. And maybe part of what needs to be explored in the dynamic of the relationship is how does the resource management need to shift so that the projector gets access to the resources they need to be able to restore their energy so that they can come back and contribute the nature of the brilliance and the gift that they have to bring to the world. Our last types are reflectors who have a role in the world to reflect back to the collective how we're doing on our path of evolution. It's through the mirror of the reflector that we see the health of our community, the wellness of our community, this level of alignment of our community. It's through that that reflection that we have the opportunity collectively to calibrate ourselves. If we see our reflector is not happy, then we need to look at what's going on with us collectively that's creating environment that's keeping the reflector reflecting back to us, unhappiness. As such, the reflector is our calibrator type. We need our reflectors to facilitate for us calibrating where we are on our alignment with our evolution collectively. The emotional theme of the reflector is disappointment. If you go back and you remember that the reflector chart is got all nine centers undefined or white or open, And that anything in your chart that is white or open has the potential to amplify energy. And you think about this this reflector with this nine centers open being able to amplify nine different archetypal themes in their open centers. And through that amplification to become deeply wise about how that energy works. When we think about the reflector from that point of view, we see that a Reflector is a being who is wearing an energy suit that has the capacity to deeply see, know, experience, and feel the full potential of the human condition. And as such, they're here to reflect what they're seeing in the current reality through the lens of their knowingness of that potential. And that knowingness about that potential can sometimes be disappointing. 
it's hard when you can see what is truly possible for humanity and you look at what humanity is currently doing to maybe not be disappointed. So recognizing if you love a reflector, that sometimes that disappointment is not personal, but rather a disappointment in humanity that comes from the ability to innately see the full potential of the human condition. And that secondly, on a more personal level, because the reflector decision-making process takes time, sometimes a lot of time, because a reflector, when they need to make a choice, they have to tease through all these different options, all these different energies, and the changeable experience of their own energy based on the movement of the moon, that if they're not given the freedom and the support and the love to take the time they need to make a good choice, sometimes from the pressure of the, the need to make a choice quickly, they make a choice that isn't good for them. And then they're forced to either deal with the consequences of that choice or they have to back out and find a different opportunity for themselves. And that can also lead to the experience of disappointment. Imagine that you wanted something in your life and you wanted it to show up in a certain way and you got maybe an opportunity to create it. You saw the potential of the opportunity to create it, but it wasn't exactly the right opportunity, but you didn't have enough time to really feel your way into whether that was the right opportunity or not. And it got threatened, maybe there was pressure to make a decision quickly and you leapt into it against maybe your better, your better knowingness, but you did it anyway because our society moves way, way faster than you do. And now you're forced to deal with the consequences of this choice that you made and you're disappointed because you wanted something else. You had a picture of something different, something better, but you didn't have the time to really feel your way into whether that was correct or not. So when our, our reflector loves are disappointed, we need to A, talk to them about, it must be really hard to know the full potential of humanity and to feel the pain of the world. How can I love you better while you experience this? And number two, we need to do our best to diligently encourage our reflector loves to take their time or to craft an environment that supports them in giving them the time that they need to make good, and strong choices. And in my next section, I want to go through just some little things that are in the chart, some fun things for you to contemplate and think about when you're looking at your, your, your loved one's charts or your own chart. So I'm going to go through the next section. The next section is going to be quick and easy. And you're just going to get an opportunity to, to take a sneak peek into some little elements in the chart that you might want to look at in your loved one's charts or in your own chart, just to give you some, some insights into some other things I see happening in relationship dynamics. Always ask generators and manifesting generators, yes and no questions. Do you want some chocolate? Do you want to go to bed now? Are you happy? Do you need to go to school today? Do you have to go to school today? Did you do your homework? Are you wearing your shoes? Do you want to come talk to me? Yes or no questions for generator types. Never, ever, ever ask manifestors, projectors, or reflectors questions, and in particular, yes or no questions. Because the minute you start to talk to your manifestors, projectors, or reflectors through yes or no questioning or questioning in general, you're calling on them to answer from a conditioned sacral response. And when they're responding with their conditioned sacral, you don't know if what they're saying is actually their truth. You don't know if what they're saying is actually what they really know as their truth. And it's unhealthy for them. So always ask or make statements or open-ended statements with manifestors, projectors, and reflectors. Like, I'm wondering whether you'd like to sit down and talk to me. Talk to me about how you're feeling right now. You look really upset. I'm wondering if you'd like to share with me what's going on with you. These are open-ended statements that invite communication without asking. So practice. It takes practice because especially for our generator types, we are so conditioned to ask, right? That's what, that's what we do even when we're parenting, generator parents, right? They say, can you go pick up your toys now? Okay. Right. We turn everything into a question and we usually add that little extra question on the end. Right. Because we know intuitively don't tell anybody what to do. People need to be asked. 
but your manifestors, projectors, and reflectors need to be queried in a way that isn't drawing on their conditioned sacral response. Projectors, reflectors, people with undefined throats or a white throat or non-motorized throats sometimes that can sometimes be generator types and people with open G centers. They need sounding boards in their lives. They need to be able to talk through what's going on in their lives for them to get clarity. That might mean, especially if you are a manifestor or a manifesting generator in relationship with a projector or a reflector or an undefined throat or somebody with an open G center, that your partner has to talk a lot. And the biggest gift you can give someone with this configuration is the open space for you to hold space for them while they talk. Understand that they aren't asking you for advice unless they do they're asking you to listen which if you rearrange the letters in the word listen you get the word silent okay or you say mm -hmm, uh -huh, oh ah this is how you listen right you don't give them advice you don't dump all your opinions and thoughts into it you simply hold space you reflect back if necessary and let them talk through out loud what they need to talk through. It's not that they need advice. It's that they need a place to be able to talk because it's through the process of seeing through com communication, through talking, their own process out loud on the table that they're able to get clarity about what they need and want. Other configurations, and this is not by any means definitive or conclusive, but other configurations of sometimes people who need to talk or who talk a lot, oftentimes people with the gate 56 talk a lot. And part of what they're talking about is stories. They're storytellers. And they're going to tell you oftentimes, especially when they have an undefined throat and they've never had the experience of feeling seen or heard before, when they come into relationship with you and now you're sitting and you're holding space for them to talk until they get used to that being a common part of their everyday experience. And it feels so good to know that if they need to talk, there's somebody in their life who loves them, who will listen to them. They oftentimes have to dump a lot of storytelling before they can get to that place of feeling, oh, I'm being heard, I'm being listened to. So the Gay 56 is oftentimes gonna tell you a lot of stories. When I do relationship composites, it's pretty common that the person who carries the gate 56 defined in their chart is often a storyteller. And sometimes that's semi-problematic to the partner who sometimes loses patience with the storytelling. The undefined throat or the non-motorized throat, which basically means generators, projectors, and reflectors, because when they are talking, they are moving energy, okay? Then they are talking, they are moving energy. And that talking is oftentimes a way to dissipate energy that they build up in the chart. They will oftentimes talk a lot as a way of letting out the energy that they've been holding onto. The open G center oftentimes also will talk a lot. And again, part of it is that they have to talk around and around and around all the energy of all the identities and all the directions they've taken in in their lives, especially over the shorter period of time, to get to where they hit that vein of gold that is their direction, their place where they want to go, their decision, their clarity. And there are, you know, for many of us, we have a deep need to kind of talk through things again not because we want advice or criticism or opinions, but just because we need space to move the energy until we can feel that inner click of, ah, that's it. That's my truth in there, a mixed in with everybody else's. Because in my open G, I've been taking in all these other directions and identities. We have to talk about this because this is a thing that we say to people and we judge it. And it's so unfair. People who talk about themselves, oftentimes have an ego definition to the throat. Now, I have drawn on this chart a couple of ways that happens. I do want you to know that it can happen in some other more convoluted ways as well. I have had people in my life who have had a will center that's gone through the emotional solar plexus and from the emotional solar plexus up to the throat. 
I have had clients who have had ego centers or will centers that have gone through the spleen and then up to the throat. The bottom line is if you have somebody who has a channel that in some way gets will center energy to the throat, this is oftentimes someone who's going to talk about themselves or their own experiences because the will center, which is sometimes called the ego, is the place where we have the personal differentiation of the, the, the human self. This is literally the ego. The ego is a resource for others. In its highest expression, the will center gives us through its own storytelling, through its own expression, through its own sharing, the ability to create resources for ourselves. This is actually teaching energy. The 2145, which connects the will center directly to the throat without going through the G center, is a teaching energy. The information, the energy in this will center, the ability to transform something of pain into something of value or something of power lives in this will center and people who are living out that highest expression of that energy in the will center, when they talk about their own experience or they talk about their journey, they're giving us a story that is a resource that can help us activate the same in our own lives. So let's start being more gentle about some of the people who talk only about themselves because maybe that's part of their design and that's the only voice they have. And that's not problematic or egotistical or arrogant. It's just the nature of how they need to talk. Let's talk briefly about what do, the diff what do people need to feel loved? Remember that our generators, projectors, and reflectors in particular need to feel heard, which means make time in the way in which you interact with them to give them space to talk. Manifestors and manifesting generators might not need time to talk, but they might need to be informed. And that actually informing them makes them feel loved and giving them space also makes them feel loved. People who have a defined G center that is connected to the throat need to feel accepted and never criticized, which can be sometimes a challenging dynamic. If you have a lot of individuality in your chart or you love someone who has individuality in your chart and remember you guys, I know this is hard to like look at and look at your chart online and look at back at your chart. Individuality in order to feel love needs to feel accepted. People who have a lot of individuality are here to be different. So they need to feel accepted for who they are, not changed or transformed by other people. People who have a lot of tribal circuitry need to feel connected and they need touch. In fact, when you touch them, they hear you better. By the way, individuality is highly auditory. They also usually need to talk. They process auditorily, although sometimes that auditory processing is inside their heads in their, when they're listening to their own voice in their head. Collective circuitry craves meaning. People who have a lot of collective circuitry are looking for something really meaningful in life, something that's going to drive them beyond their personal experience. They're on a mission. Fantasy in relationships can oftentimes happen in these two channels. You can have one channel or the other or both or gates. So it, there's not a whole lot of math here necessarily, but if you've got any of these gates or channels in your relationship composite, pay attention because these two channels create an element of fantasy in communication, which means oftentimes what happens is you think your partner agreed to do something or you think your partner said something that maybe they didn't actually say. And so there's expectations around something that was based on a fantasy that didn't actually happen. And now you're fighting about something that's projected and not completely true and fantastically based and messy. <laughs> so be aware if you have this configuration in your chart that there's a potential for each of you to project expectation onto each other. And so be doubly sure that communication is clear. I always tell couples who have this in their composite to keep a notebook of your 
your agreements. You said we do this at this day or this, we do this, have weekly meetings and like write down your agreements so that you have a reference point before you freak out and get frustrated with someone because there's a fantasy happening and you're, what you're expecting or the expectation that you have isn't actually based in reality. Obviously, fifth line projection energy and second line energy figures in with this as well. So if you've got a five in your profile or a two in your profile, there's also a potential there for there to be projection about expectation and fantasy. Either of these three channels, especially if you have one partner that has one gate and another partner that has the other gate, it's called an electromagnetic. If you have an electromagnetic in any of these channels, it oftentimes creates a dynamic that can be a dynamic of power struggle. One of the things that's so important to remember is if you have the 2145, which is the one on the far right that connects the will center to the throat, oftentimes those struggles will be over money. So it's oftentimes good if you've got that channel in your relationship composite to get a third party like a financial planner or somebody to help you manage the money so that it doesn't become a personal struggle. The five and the 15 together often struggle over the rhythm in the family or the rhythm in the relationship. And 15 doesn't want to have a rhythm or they try to have a rhythm, but they can't stick with it. And the five is so rhythmic, it's boring. So it's actually when you can talk through it, this can be a really good configuration. The biggest thing to remember is people with the five, especially they need the rhythm. Don't judge the 15 that can't keep the rhythm for longer than a week. The 28, 38. The best way to channel that challenge is to get active together. This can be a very sexy combination. This can be a very adventure-based combination. This is an energy that needs a lot of physical movement to dissipate some of the tension that gets built up in the relationship and that can sometimes devolve into power struggle. So move this energy in any way possible and it'll minimize some of the power struggles. The struggles though that happen in that channel are the struggles over determining what's really valuable in the relationship. So some of the struggles are good struggles to have because they're good, important, clarifying values-based conversations. Some of it's just tension that needs to be moved. Remember, and this is so important to understand, talking is a way of moving energy, okay? It's a way of getting energy that you've collected like static when you scooch across the carpet in the wintertime in Minnesota. Sometimes talking is like shot, you know, that static electricity. You just got to move it because it dissipates the energy that you've picked up. There's a difference between talking and communication. And sometimes you need to just create space for your partner or for yourself to talk. Communication happens when there's an exchange of information and ideas. It's really important to distinguish the difference between talking and communication and recognize that in some relationships, you really need both and that talking can't be confused with communicating and that sometimes asking clarifying questions in a way that's right according to type and learning how to do good reflective listening or taking a nonviolent communication course is a really good skill set to have because it allows you to be present to the, to the movement of the energy through talking but also to really hear when communication is happening. So here's some questions I'll leave you with based on this presentation, some things you can take home and contemplate or explore with your partners. How can you better hear your partner? What do you think based on your partner's chart that they need to feel heard and seen and loved? And what do you need to feel more seen and heard and loved? You. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Be well, take care. I will talk to you all soon. Bye.